it doesn't really make any difference because the difference is so small compared to body versus Son of God. Uh, so really, that's why you know he, he's trying to be so inclusive here and, and says you know everything is death real. This is really where we're having a hallucination of death. This is not life. People call this life, but it's not really life. You know, life as the gift of God includes no limitation whatsoever, no nothing to burden you, not, no no responsibility, no problem, nothing, no form of difficulty to burden your minds. No form, period. No form, period. Yeah. And I think the and good point is, of course, is like you're saying, the level of decision, if you start to look at mind over matter, it may sound like, ooh, that sounds good. If you still <laughs> yeah, think, what power? Power. Yeah. 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 if you still think, That's I want to be a person <laughs> in this world yeah. and have mind over matter, that would be the decision where yeah. I want to choose not to feel hot when it's 90 right. degrees or whatever, this and that. And what we're doing, we're talking about holding peace as the goal and seeing, seeing our brother, seeing the Christ in our brother, and then as a byproduct, there's no discomfort in the Christ. In other words, when you can recognize the Christ in your brother and you recognize yourself as Christ, pain or death in any form is absolutely impossible. But coming at it that way, as opposed to the byproducts we're right. getting into and talking about. It keeps coming back to purpose. I mean, over and over again, mm -hmm. it seems like the discussion keeps coming back to, you know, what's the purpose behind it? What's the intention? And that's always the thing to look at. When you said, Takis, that, that we realize the truth, then we wouldn't be able to be here. I'm sure you didn't mean that we are here anyway. Right. But obviously, we're not here. You know, we are, I guess, you know, we are the dreamer, and the figures are out there. Right. Oh, so, I meant as if the conversation would end. So once you realize the truth, you know, that you are a mind, then perhaps you will appear as a body to those who still need to learn. And yet, right. go ahead. Uh, right, but I, I think you, even the, even we realize maybe at the intellectual level, <coughs> still parts of the mind have not accepted that. Yeah. And probably we know that this is true because different things happen on different days where, poop, you know, you feel the fear, you feel, you know, the, the constriction, you feel, you know, that here are my rules, you know, things are not going as I set them up according to my rules. And you suddenly you feel, you feel the the pangs of fear or anxiety or annoyance or depression or whatever and then you know that your mind really at one level it says yeah I believe I'm a mind that's God created me but really it doesn't believe it really because then you wouldn't feel any annoyance or any anxiety or any other disturbance or anything you know. That's your ego causing that though, isn't it? Right, but for the ego to have any power to cause that it means that part of, my, of me is still identifying with it and therefore even though uh, somebody can be a teacher of God still in the world to, to but, but at the same time, he also needs to learn certain lessons to continue to be in the world. Because once his lesson is over, he, he cannot possibly have any experience of being in the world. I think that's why Jesus disappeared when he was 33. He didn't you know, disappear at 70 or 80. Why didn't he stay for 40 more years to teach? Yeah, but it seems like since we're you know, not here anyway, then the appearance of whether we're here or not makes no difference because we're just figures in another's dream. Right. But does it make a difference wh whether you we have this impression that we are in here versus that the impression completely disappears? Well, it's like to me when the Course says that once we realize the truth, then we realize that it has always been. Right. Then whenever we you know realize the truth and buy into the truth as it is, Who's to say how you know what the appearance will be to that part of the sunship that is still deceived? I think what we'll, we want to do is, is keep it practical too, because from what I'm, I'm hearing yeah. is, is that as we talk and as we go into things, we can start to see some of those beliefs that we still are holding on to, and that's really what we want to do is focus on. In other words, yeah. Jesus, in some parts of the course, he'll start to talk about the oneness. You know, he'll start to talk about heaven and knowledge. You know, go. I, I was reading part in the, in the workbook today where he kind of went for a few paragraphs and he said, but there's no point in talking any further. There's much work to do, right? kind of, and, he's, and he immediately... Well, once you start to think about it, it's just so amazing. Yeah. You know, you just start, you know, it's just like, God, you know, the implications of this are... Because it's so completely contrary to ordinary patterns of living and thought. Mm -hmm. You know, 
And I think what we'll do is get into that tonight, the whole thing about, uh, you know, as long as the mind believes that it's here, he uses all those metaphors. You know, you are my hands, you are my feet, you are to reach my brother. It's, it's the metaphor that the mind can grab onto. Even the role of teacher of God it has, is a very metaphorical thing where, you know, you'll speak. I was reading a section today where he says you'll speak of things beyond this world as a teacher of God. And you'll speak that, that what is yet to come has already been. You know, I mean, that's, a, that's the idea that we were talking about last week, which is a very high metaphysical idea that the script is written. You know, that the future, what the world would consider the future, is, is the past. I call it the past past and the future past. <laughs> because because basically Jesus is saying that, that the entire script of form, you know, was spun out and the Holy Spirit had a, gave a new purpose to it and it's already healed. A lot of times people feel like if I really keep doing this course, I'm just going to poop out of here and I feel sorry for all the miserable people that are left, you know. I'm putting, in, I'm putting in all this hard work here and everything. But what it does is it, it gets away from the idea that this is a perceptual hallucination. And all that happens when you wake up is that, you know, you let go of the hallucination. There's nobody left behind because, the, you know, it's, a, it's literally it's just a hallucination. That kind of gets past that whole thing about, you know, even if, is, there, is it possible to still be there and be teaching and everything, it just keeps bringing it down to that ultimate thing that it's just a hallucination and once you wake up, really accept the atonement and everything then in a sense that God takes the final step and the mind returns to complete abstraction abstraction means no form no perception and that's so the what, natural condition what is that like? yeah a lot of the how can that be fun? we cannot speak of this we must go on <laughs>
And the deeper you go beneath the clouds, you just come down to this light, which is formless and timeless and changeless. So it seems like the body and the personality is like clothing or dressing that covers up, attempts to cover up the real thing. And that we pay 99.9% of our time paying attention to the clothing rather than to the real thing. In a sense, you can look at it this way too, that here's the surface of, of the mind, and this is where the body is, this is where you're talking about the clothing. And basically, the, this was made to cover up what's below it, which is which are the beliefs and underpinnings. It's like if you can think about this world as, you know, on stage and screenplays and, and plays in New York where they, they had a stage, and then if you go behind the stage, you can see all this wood. You know, they have got all these rafters and everything, underpinnings, holding the stage up. That here's the world of the body and all the perceptual world up here, and, and then here are all these underpinnings that are holding it up. And these are the beliefs that are in the mind. So when we talk about giving up the world or relinquishing the world, to the deceived mind it will be like, okay, I'm going to go to the Himalayas and I'm going to, I'm never going to look at girls again, I'm going to detach from pleasure, and I'm going to da 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 da, I'm going to give up, give up. And the mistake is to think that you can give up, give up the things up here, which is just the form. But what Jesus is saying is, come on, we got to go down into the mind, we got to get these, we got to get to the wood, and we got to right. get to the underpinning, the beliefs, because without getting to the beliefs, there's there's no way. And and but this was made as a cover, but the only reason this was made is as a distractive cover, so I can be so mind can get so caught up in the drama of the world and in these bodies and everything that's happening and all this so that I won't look at these beliefs. And isn't it interesting that for the ego, it's always the guilt that the ego induces is always for things that we have done. You said some of the other times that it's like you, know, you always think back and say, oh, I feel so guilty that I said that or I did that. And really, from, from Jesus' perspective, the guilt is not, the, the error is not there at all. The, the error is not at the behavioral level what you say or what you do, the error is what the mind shows to believe about who it is and who the, your brother is. There's, and nobody, nobody feels guilty. I mean, when I think about that and I let go of the behavioral level and go back in, into within to look at that level, oh, okay, who am, I cho who am I choosing to think I am and who am I choosing to think my brother is and realize the error there, it doesn't make me feel guilty. Because at that level, you know, you choose, you know, it's, it's, it's only normal to say, okay, I made an error, so now I'm willing to accept the correction of the error and accept my brother as they really are. And, and that does not induce guilt, and it seems like the ego is so persistent, doesn't want us to go to that level and make the choice again. It wants us to be preoccupied with the external level, oh my God, I said that, oh my God, I did that, and be preoccupied with that, always running the external world to fix things that we did wrong, supposedly wrong, which has nothing to do because because the error is not there and cannot be corrected at that level. But it's such a temptation, you know, to feel that the error is there. You know, I, I, I blew the test, you know, that's that's where the error is, you know. I you know, I blew my job. That's where the error is. I should you know, I should straighten up, I should now pay more attention, I should now be more cautious, I should now do this, 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 all these external things. All of that is the ego's way of salvation. It's it, it doesn't bring salvation. So what if it is Instead of way A becomes B or C or D, so you still believe in the world, you still believe in death. The point is that you know to let go of that level and not be tempted by the ego to to always look at that external level to fix things. That's not where the correction can take place.